Hi, my name is Zach with HKN, and um, today we are going to make a video about transformers. So, what we have here is we we built a little um, we have a little core that we built, and we have a wire carrying current wrapped around one edge of it. Um, we have we're going to go ahead and assume that this is um, this. This whole core is made out of some material that has a, uh, a permeability, magnetic permeability, much higher than the permeability of free space, and we'll see why in a bit. Um, and we're going to make a couple geometry assumptions about it. Um, actually, really, the only assumption we really have to make right now is that it has um, consistent cross-sectional area A everywhere. The cross-sectional area is the same. and. Um, so today we're going to deal with the the input side of this transformer. Um, next week we'll we'll deal with the output. We'll see how they relate to each other. But um, so we're going to use a couple or well um, for this side of the transformer we're going to use one of Maxwell's equations that we went over previously, and we're going to try to find um, the magnetic flux in the core. So. So let's write down some things we already know. We, we know that, um, what is it? So we're going to use Amper's Law, or part of Amper's Law. We're going to ignore the term that has to do with displacement current, because that's not going to come into play here. But we will write it down like this. Um, all right, so just a quick recap. This says that the, um, the the line integral of our magnetic um, magnetic field s strength H um, along some closed path is going to equal the current enclosed by that path. Um, also, we'll note down that um, we said we're trying to find flux. Actually, first we'll note down that um, our B field. So B is um, is magnetic flux density. Um, our B field is equal to mu times H, where and um, mu is equal to mu naught, the permeability of free space, times mu R, which is relative permeability, which we said um, for this. Whatever material, um, it, iron's pretty common. There's other common things, but um, mu r um, for some materials is on the order of, of thousands. So we can have materials that have mu a thousand times greater than uh, the permeability of free space, and we'll see why that's important. Um, also, we said we're trying to find flux, so we'll write down that um, what the definition of magnetic flux is. We'll have our B field, with a dotted with a differential area, um, that is going to equal flux, magnetic flux. All right, so let's see what we can do with these equations and the situation to find the magnetic flux in this core. And by that, we mean how much of our B field um, is flowing through through this cross-sectional surface. So um, where should we start here? So we know from Amper's law that this current I is going to generate a magnetic field. And we'll try to do a little bit of reasoning as to uh, maybe what direction that magnetic field will be in. Um, we know we have to integrate along some some path. Actually, let's do this first. So let's sort of zoom in on on one half of this coil. We say that our current is flowing here around this coil like that. So if we cut this coil in half, or actually, if we cut it this way in a plane, it would look sort of like 
we would have um, current flowing out there, current flowing in there, out. Um, so on and so forth. So um, we would have, so these are, these are wires, right? And we can kind of imagine them. So our current would be flowing out here, kind of around our core, then back in behind it, out, and this is all the core area in here. So what, um, let's try to figure out what direction our um, magnetic field would be um, pointing in this core. So we would say that um, we could use our right hand rule. Um, I'm sorry. So for our situation here, we actually have current flowing in this side, right? Um, current would be flowing into the board on this side and out on this side. So I, I put that in the wrong direction. Just imagine those are dots. OK. So now, now we use our right hand rule. Um, we know that if we have current flowing in some direction, we can get the um, resulting direction of our magnetic field by pointing our, th our right hand thumb in the direction of the current, and then our fingers curl in the direction of the magnetic field. So we have our current flowing into the board here. Um, if we do our right hand rule, point our thumb into the board, um, our magnetic field curls around each of these wires in this direction, right? But um, what did we do? We kind of set a bunch of wires side to side. And so their magnetic fields, they each have a magnetic field curling around. They're each carrying um, current I, because it's, it's all in a loop. But the, so what actually ends up happening when you add enough of the, or when you stack enough of these wires on top of each other, that their, their um, magnetic fields this way, horizontally, are kind, end up kind of being inconsequential. And we get that the magnetic field from this one adds to the magnetic field from this one. And we get a net magnetic field just in a, basically in a linear direction in the center of that core. Now, um, if we did the same reasoning with this side, we would have that um, current is pointed, um, what do we say, it's pointed in there. It's pointed out of the board here. That means our, according to our right hand rule, our magnetic field curl like this. And we'd get the same thing. We have a bunch of wires stacked. Um, the magnetic field from this side would be pointing in the same direction as magnetic field from this side. So we get a a net magnetic field like that. Um, so that was basically reasoning just to choose the direction. So we say that our magnetic field strength H is going to be pointed in that direction. Now we need to figure out um, how, you know, what the magnitude of H is. Um, all right. so, so what do we say for, we'll use Amper's Law for that. And what do we say we need to do for Amper's law? We need to pick a we need to pick a path to integrate H around, and um, and this is where we're going to get a little bit from um, away from hardcore mathematics and physics and do more engineering. We're going to make some assumptions. So we're going to assume since we have this situation here where. Um, our relative permeability of this core is a lot greater than the permeability of free space. That is, that's literally saying that um, it's easier, it's much, much easier to generate a magnetic field in this core than it is in air. Um, so what we're going to assume is that the, the vast majority of the magnetic field from this is going to take this path just around this core. Um, turns out that's a pretty good assumption if we measure things. In practice, um, some magnetic field will leak out, um, but it's, it's, if our permeability of this core is high enough, it's, it's usually negligible. So we're going to assume that for purposes here that this is ideal and all of our magnetic field flows in here. So, 
So that gives us a little bit of a clue as where to pick the um, path we want to integrate around. Um, we will pick the average path that a magnetic field would be. Um, we'll pick the average path around this core. Um, and where would that be? Um, we didn't really define dimensions um, for this, the width and height of this. But, um, and let's keep it symbolic Let's for now. But um, it would be, the average path would be the path directly through the middle of this, correct? Um, drifted off a little bit down here, but let's say let's say we knew the dimensions of our core. Um, and we did some algebra, and we came up with this path being length L. So, so then we assumed that our H field mo um, is almost entirely contained in this core. And its direction is always going to agree with this here. So we're going to say that our H field is, is always practically parallel to our path. And that's a situation we like, because we, then we don't have to do integration. Um, so now, um, Amper's law for integrating H around this path with length L. Um, since we said H is usually parallel to L, we're going to go H times L is equal to I enclosed. Now, um, what? so we know that I enclosed is the current enclosed by our path. So what is that going to be in this case? We have, we have this path here, and we know the current enclosing it or enclosed by it is going to be the current in these wires, right? The current flowing out of the board here is not enclosed by our path, but the current flowing into the board here is, right? It's basically going to be enclosing this part of our, of our cross section of our um, coil. And what would the current be there? Um, we know we have n turns of um, our coil has n turns. So we'd have n wires stacked up on top of each other. And we know they're all carrying, cu carrying current I um, because they're in a, in a coil, right? So I enclosed is going to equal n times I, right? So we'll have H times L is equal to n times I. So um, we can quickly rearrange this to say H. Remember, um, H is a vector. Um, that is equal to Ni over L. L is our path length. Now, um, now ultimately, what do we want to find? We want to find our flux, um, the the uh, area surface integral over this this area cross-sectional area of our B field, right? So we want to convert this now to uh, a B field, and we know that they have this relationship here. Um, they're just it's scaled by the permeability of this core. So we're going to say that B is going to equal um, mu naught mu uh, relative permeability times n times i all over L. So that is going to be the uh, magnitude of our flux density at any, any point in this core. So um, one other assumption we make is that the B field is uniformly distributed in the core. As in, uh, uh, it's uniformly distributed in its cross-sectional area. Um, that turns out to be pretty reasonable, too. Um, so, so now we have an expression for B, and we're going to find our, um, our flux. So actually, um, I kind of just gave it away just now, but what did we just say? We said that we're assuming that our, our B field is uniformly distributed. 
Um, our B field vectors all have this magnitude. So what? Um, oh, and we also can assume that the, um, the B field is more or less always perpendicular to our cross-sectional area. So um, if we remember from last time we calculated flux, if we have our B field perpendicular to our um, area and it's uniform, we can the integration of B dot DA just becomes B times A, right? So we're going to say that our magnetic flux is equal to B times A. And let's see, we have a term for B. Um, so we're going to say our magnetic flux ultimately is going to equal um, mu naught mu R B. Uh, that's not supposed to be there. A, N, I, all over L. Now, that was obtained by subbing this term in for B in this term. Um, so this is what we said we were going to be looking for. And um, this is important because um, next week we'll find out what happens if we wrap a coil around this side. Um, and don't necessarily give it any current. We'll see. We'll see what what current or voltage results. Um, remember that. Let's see. In this term for flux, we have um, an, our term I, and we should be able to um, make I any value we want it. Say, I mean, we could make it a constant value. Um, we could also make it like a sinusoidal value. That happens a lot because AC. Um, AC stands for alternating current. It's in a sinusoid. Um, what we'll find is that we'll use Faraday's law next week to um, to induce a voltage in a coil over here, um, given a time varying flux. So we'll vary I with time, and we will see what happens with that. Um, I think that's good for today. Thank you.